Hey guys, today be making a different kind of video for y'all. So today's topic is how to install a Synthtaste brand power supply update in your memory moke. So a uh, special shout out to Martin at Synthtaste who actually sent me the supply. Uh, and really do appreciate the support, Martin, and the opportunity to work with your product here. Um, it's a really clean power supply. Uh, I've actually had some units in here with the supply. It has a really good ripple factor. It's adjustable. And it's actually using off-the-shelf uh, Meanwell brand modules. But he's developed the circuit board to support the memory mode. So it's got actually circuitry in it, so it's not just a, a dumb, you know, make it work kind of situation here. He's actually taken what's in existence and made it into a circuitry design that's specifically made for the memory mode. And I think it's just really fantastic. Um, so the benefit of the supply is, is it eliminates the fan, it eliminates the power supply, and the transformer the big heavy transformer. So if you're looking for something to be a little bit more modern, eliminate some of that stuff, this, this is a great option for you. Um, so anyways, a disclaimer, I do not take responsibility for any damages caused by the installation of this supply. It's up to you to know how to install it and follow the procedures given, um, as well as the, the uh, steps in this video that we'll be going through. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, you know, don't, don't feel bad that you don't feel comfortable just get somebody that does uh, because this is this does take some modifications it's not just a plug-and-play supply you have to modify the digital board and you have to uh, jump one pin on the actual power connector to make all this work so like I say if you don't feel comfortable you know just don't don't go there leave it up to somebody that does a technician that works on these things or even somebody that's into electronics that understands this stuff it also helps to understand the theory of operation of the memory mode uh, because there's, you're getting into some circuitry of the memory mode itself. So uh, just keep that in mind, guys. I just want to bring that up. But uh, like I say, that's another reason I like this supply. is because you don't have to cut the connector off. You can actually use the factory harness, which is really nice. You just change. You basically just unplug one pin and you move it over to a different pin out. So that's really all you do. Um, so the other thing I want to bring up too real quick before we get started is don't expect this supply to solve all your problems. About 99% of the time, the supply is not the problem in these units. And I've worked on many of these units now. Uh, a lot of times it's other components that are failing or has failed, causing a voltage rail to be pulled down. And uh, everybody blames the supply. It's not the supply. Uh, there's a lot of components in these things that age poorly. Or just, you know, components wear out. You have to, you have to remember that too. Components do wear out. Um, it's just like, an, like a tractor engine. We'll use a tractor as an example because a car goes by mileage, a tractor goes by hours. The more hours you have on components, the more wear there is in that component. The more wear you have, the more current draw in some cases. And the more current draw you have, the more heat's on the heat sink. So that is something to remember. Uh, that's typical why I only do restorations on these units. Because it's a way I can eliminate everything that would cause excessive current draw as well as failures and it just increases the reliability and it makes everything run cooler. Just, an, just as an example here, before restoration on some of these units I get in here, uh, I do a, a pre-diagnostics run and the heat sink, I actually take readings off the heat sink to see where we're running at because that can tell me a lot about the current factors as well. Um, and typically I've actually had some of these units in here run up to 200 degrees. Uh, one after restoration, it still runs warm because it's a linear supply they use, but they run around 100, 100 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So 220 degrees Fahrenheit versus 100 degrees Fahrenheit is a big difference. And, uh, you know, like I say, it's going to run warm anyways just because of the factor of it being a linear supply that Moog used. But I uh, just want to bring all that up. So like I say, what I recommend before you install this supply for any technicians out there is do a full restoration, recap everything, replace all the uh, common failure components that you know of. You know, make sure everything's healthy before you do this because it's going to make your life a lot easier than having to troubleshoot if something's wrong with the supply or something's wrong with the unit. Um, it's just a, a, a good way to start off. Um, because there is a lot of electrolytic capacitors in these things that, I mean, every unit I've ever had in here has leaked, has started leaking the fluid. Uh, there's a dielectric fluid in those caps, and they actually start leaking out the end and corroding. And it actually will get down to the point it corrodes tracings on the board. So, you know, I do recommend a recap with the su supply minimally. I mean, that's just being minimal. 
Um, but like I say, I do restorations mainly because I can guarantee my work. Um, it's the way I know what comes in and what goes out, and I know that everything's you know working, full calibration, etc. That's why I spend so much time on these things. Um, and of course, the more hours you put on it, the more wear you're going to have. So some units that have been played more heavily need more of a restoration uh, in general, just because it's got more more hours on it. But uh, anyways, guys, I know that's a lot to cover there. I just want to make all that uh, information available for you guys before we start with the supply. So now with nothing better to do, we'll start installing the supply. Okay, I've now got the unit opened up here, and I'm going to show you what we'll be removing. Now also part of the disclaimer I should have mentioned too is that you'll be around 120 volts if you still got power plugged in. We'll be working on 120 volt circuitry, uh, AC. So make sure you have this thing unplugged before you start you know, working on the inside of this unit in this, in this area. Uh, you do not want to get 120 volts or 220 or 230 or wherever you're located in your country. Um, it would not be a fun day. So the things we're going to be removing, so we're removing the fan, the transformer, and the power supply. So by removing the power supply, you can actually go in and start by removing these plugs here on the, on the actual uh, power supply board. So these actually come down off the transformer. These are your secondary windings of this transformer. The primary windings will be over here. So we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, but we'll start just by removing the transformer itself by getting these bolts out. Now these are 3 8 nuts. And on the bottom there's actually a Phillips head, but you will not be able to break these things loose really easy. What Moog did is they used a, a red Loctite on these screws. And so they are they they really do not come out very easy. So what I do is I use some vice grips on the bottom to lock onto the the head of the of the bolt, and then I use a impact to run these things out. Um, it takes a little bit of muscle. You can also use a socket wrench. Uh, I recommend a socket wrench, not a socket driver, because you have to put some torque on these guys to get them broke loose. Um, avoid if you're going to cut these off. You can cut these off as well, but avoid. Uh, damaging the chassis finish, uh, especially if you're if, if you're a technician, especially you do not want to do anything that's going to make this thing look ugly for your client. You want to keep everything clean and and you know well preserved. And if you're going to cut anything from the top, make sure you cover all your boards. You do not want to get any metal particles in the circuitry. And you also want to make sure you vacuum everything out really good. One reason I, I really avoid cutting inside the chassis because you don't want to have any of that inside the chassis at all because that could be a factor of damage um, and you don't want that. Foreign object damage is what that would be called or FOD. Um, so you want to avoid FOD at all cost and uh, you just want to clean everything up as, as clean as you can. So let me put the camera on a tripod. We'll get started here and I'll show you how I do it. Okay, just show you real quick. I did one of these just to kind of show you how I do this. So I've got this out right here and I then take the nut off the back of the transformer, pull this forward, now I can get to this back nut right here. Now with this red Loctite, as I mentioned, I use impact. So I'm using this impact right here that my good buddy gave me with a 3 8 millimeter, uh, I'm sorry, 3 8 inch uh, socket that I can actually put on that. And then what I do is I start it with a screwdriver because I forgot my vice grips, unfortunately. Uh, but I hold the, the bottom with the screwdriver just to get this thing broke loose, get it down far enough and I get a pair of channel locks on it. And then when I get the pair of channel locks, I just run it out with the uh, impact. Here's the channel locks I'm using. And that's how I do it. So I set the camera on a tripod so you can kind of see how this thing, how this works. It's tricky. It takes some work uh, to get it like you want it. Uh, but like I say, you, you can do this. It's a little noisy here, so bear with the noise. But I'll put a screwdriver on it just, just to get it uh, broke loose first. I get it broke loose like that right there. Of course, you can see it vibrates pretty hard there. So everything's vibrating off. So I recommend removing everything out of the chassis because <laughs> you'll be dropping stuff off of it. Because it does, it takes impact to get these things off of the red Loctite. Um, you can't just use a a basic uh, system. You can use a socket wrench, but like I say, it's very very tricky. If I get it loose enough where I can grab around the the screw on the bottom. And then I run the, uh, it's a little tricky here. Uh, 
like I say, you see the real frustration here, because this is the kind of stuff that uh, that happens. So go here and loosen just a little bit more. I think that's gonna be good enough. Yeah, now I can get on it. So now we're on it there. Now I can take my pliers, hold it. And it comes right out. So there's that one out of there. So I got two more to go on the other side and the transformer will be loose. So I'll catch up with you after I get this out of here. Okay guys, I'm going to document something I do a little bit different on this side of the transformer for moving the bolts. Basically what it was, the socket I was using this was too fat around the edges. So I'm using a, a, a deep well uh, socket here that's a little more shallow as far as the side depth. And I'm actually able to was able to get on that nut, and I'm actually using a a screw head on my impact, and I can run it out that way. Same thing on this side. I loosen that nut on the bottom of the transformer, and so I can pull the uh, actual transformer bolts out uh, that actually holds the transformer together. Uh, so I remove that out a little bit, so now I can get to that back socket. I'll be doing it the same way with this uh, socket here, and then impact on the bottom. And that's how I'm removing this thing. I also went on and unbolted the fan. It's just uh, four screws I showed you on the bottom. You take those out, the fan becomes loose. Unplug this connector here to the fuse. Uh, this will actually be eliminated as well. Uh, we'll get into the actual harness here in a few minutes. All right, so I now have the transformer unbolted. As you can see, got the fan removed. This harness here, this all come out together except for these wires right here. These are actually going to my LHC. Um, but uh, on some of these memory mugs, depending on what serial number you have, Sometimes this is actually hardwired. This is your main wiring harness coming from the supply to your DMUX board. Sometimes it'll be actually wired in with this guy, so you have to actually clip the, uh, the zip ties and remove it away from the actual power, uh, transformer harness. Uh, in this case, we got all this, so this is, uh, this, all this wiring here will be removed with the transformer and fan. And I also make this fuse block right here, so this fuse block will be coming out as well. But what you want to do is you'll go up here to the power switch, and of course I got these already disconnected. Uh, but you'll take the blue wire and black wire that are connected together. You'll pull it off the switch. It's actually got just a uh, uh, a terminal on it, and then same thing for this one. So it's actually just uh, in there, unplugs, and then you, there's your power switch. So you'll keep these two wires here coming from your IAC jack into the power switch. This is a dual power switch for those that don't really understand what they're looking at here. So you got your line and neutral, and the switch actually breaks both the line and neutral from this side of the power when your switch is off. So it's actually kind of a safety, a safety switch. On some sense, you only see it as a, a single pole switch, I meaning it only breaks just the, the line voltage, and your common stays connected. In this case, they're just using a dual switch to break both. But uh, now we've got that disconnected. Let me put the camera in the tripod. And now you can see that we can actually remove, swing it around here right quick, there we go. So now we're actually going to remove this thing as a whole. So here's our transformer, our fan, we'll get around this wiring here on my particular unit, and there it is. So there's your transformer, your fan, and the harness making up. And this transformer is not damaged in any way removing it, so this is still a great transformer. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with this fan. So you can actually put it in a box, put it in your attic, or sell it, or whatever you'd want to do with it. And, uh, you know, these are, uh, I really high, highly recommend keeping this. Um, because if nothing else, I would like to have them because I, I use them in restoration sometimes when this transformer fails. It's very rare to see it fail, but when it does, it's good to have spares. So anyways, we set that to the side over here. We set it on the floor. And I'll tell you what, just out of curiosity, Let's see what that transformer weighs right quick. Just see how much weight you're losing right there. Okay, I just put this transformer and fan on my scale just to see how much weight you're actually losing from the units. And you're actually losing 7.7 .7 pounds. So that's actually, you know, 7 pounds that you're getting rid of right there. So now we'll see what the, what the new power supply weighs. Okay, so here's the, the whole power supply assembly here. And it weighs actually 1.4 pounds. So that's a... Uh, a nice weight loss right there you get just from removing the transformer fan. We'll lose a little bit more with the power supply because it has a heat sink on it 
and uh, so we'll see what it weighs all together so we can get an idea of just what how much weight we're actually removing from this unit doing this okay now since we've got the transformer removed the fan removed and the harness removed we're now ready to turn our attention to the actual main power supply so uh, what I like to do and I'm gonna bring this up real quick because this is something that is important uh, when you work around circuitry especially is uh, on the AC stuff it wasn't quite as critical because we weren't actually working in the main circuitry but now since we're getting into the actual circuitry what you want to do is you want to actually use an ESD strap so I've got an electrostatic discharge is what ESD stands for and I've got it connected to the chassis but I've also got the chassis tied to earth through a IC jack here hooked to the chassis and what that does that that actually earth references me to the ground the earth ground and so that prevents me from having static discharge and damaging components at this stage since we're actually getting right here by the circuitry now depending on your humidity level if you're working on one of these in the winter time you want to be strapped up even when you're working on the transformer because when you're removing these bolts over here you're actually pretty close to this this digital board and you can actually have ESD discharge across that board and you can actually damage things so keep that in mind uh, when you're working on this stuff as well that static is, is a is a definite killer for circuitry and it can cause latent failures it can cause all kind of stuff so just keep that in mind so now we're going to be removing this actual power supply here so you unplug the main harness going into your DMUX board it actually goes down here you can see where it goes it unplugs from a P131 on the power supply you unplug that and now we've, we're ready to remove this the supply so you got three screws holding this uh, power supply to the main heat sink so that's what I really love about the memory mode too is they got plenty of heat sink uh, so there's a lot of capacitance for the heat dissipation uh, to come out of the unit a lot of scents in this area use a real thin heat sink and it just build up with heat and that's why they run hotter so uh, what we're gonna do let me put the camera on the tripod here and we'll uh, we'll go through this so I'm going to remove these three screws here. Now another thing is to denote is that you want to get something to set the supply on because there's thermal compound, that white stuff you've seen uh, between the uh, heat sink of the power supply and the main heat sink. So I've got this sheet right here I use when I re rebuild power supplies. And you can see all that thermal compound that's on there. That's that white stuff. Uh, that stuff, a funny story is when I first started working on polymogs back in the day as a kid, I pulled one of these power supplies out of a polymog and I dropped it right on my carpet and I had a white spot on my carpet even when we moved out of the house <laughs> so uh, you want to be kind of careful where you place the supply because that stuff is nasty it's actually like a grease uh, but what it does is it works kind of like uh, antifreeze in a car it actually helps with the uh, transfer of heat between the two metals is what it does and that's its whole purpose it, it helps uh, with the performance of heat uh, dissipation. So we're going to move these three screws here and this supply is ready to pull out. Now this might be a little tricky because sometimes it forms a suction between that thermal compound so you sometimes want to take it to base and just kind of rock it. There you go, mine popped out. I actually serviced the supply not too long ago. Since this is my personal unit I had done a full restoration on it but uh, you know do some stuff as a preventive service. So there's our supply. So you can see there's our, our main supply there. It's out and you can see that thermal compound I was talking about. And of course whenever you redo a power supply too, you want to make sure you clean all that thermal compound off the heat sink as well as the bottom and start with a fresh compound surface. That, that definitely helps with the transfer of the heat. Um, sometimes you get trash in between this and then you don't really get a good connection between the heat sink and this thing will run hotter than what you're actually running on the outside heat sink. So there's our power supply. So let's get rid of pretty much everything we need to get rid of as far as the actual old power supply system. And now we're ready to install the new supply. But before we do that, I would highly recommend taking some time to clean all this up, which is what I'm about to do. I'm gonna vacuum this chassis out. I'm gonna get a, a alcohol and actually clean this thermal compound off. I'm keeping my heat sink on my unit uh, because I may in the future, if I have to, I can go back to the original supply if I ever desire to go back to original, which I highly doubt I will, but you know, it's just one of those things. Plus it makes it look original on the outside, which is kind of what I'm about in my, in my case. So let me clean all this up and I'll be back here in a minute. 
Okay, so I got this all vacuumed out right here. You can see that's still that's nice and clean. You'll still see the uh, the Loctite. That's the red Loctite that was holding those bolts in for the transformer. But now I'm going to just kind of show you how I clean the heat sink because I think this might be something handy for you guys as well. So actually, I use a gasket scraper. This is what I use for my Z car as well as everything else when I have to replace a gasket, you know, a uh, valve cover gasket or or whatever kind of gasket, but it does really good for removing the thermal compound, especially when it's really thick in places. So what I do is I take it, and actually I usually do it from the other side. With my wrist strap on, just because I'm around all the circuitry, is I'll take it, I'm gonna pull this wire here up, and I'm actually gonna just kinda go over this heat sink, and you can see I remove it off, like this right here, you can see the glob on there, and then I just take a rag here, wipe it off, and then I'll just keep doing that till I get it pretty clean. And I go up against the chassis too with this thing, kind of scrape against the chassis to get out of the corners where it just kind of squishes out into the corners. And it doesn't take very much thermal compound either, guys. Whenever y'all are replacing these, these are re repairing the original transform, uh, tra the original power supply. I'll get it right in here in a minute. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot of thermal compound. I see a lot of these units where people just squeeze all kind of thermal compound in there, and actually that kind of just that actually kind of uh, makes the situation worse because you can actually have too much and it won't it won't actually dissipate the heat correctly. So you don't want you don't want very much. But yeah, we'll just scrape this off here. And once I get most of the thick stuff off, like what you're seeing there. I'll actually go over it with alcohol, and then that cleans everything up really good. Get this corner right here real quick. So we got that pretty much cleaned up right there. So now I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna lay that on mine because this is my unit. I don't. If this is anybody else's unit, I'd actually pull the keyboard before I did anything just to prevent damage. But since this is mine, it doesn't really. I'm not worried about mine as much. So now we'll actually go over this thing with some alcohol. And you'll still have a little residue in there just because it gets actually between the chassis and that heat sink. But uh, you really just want it where you're not going to stick your hand in it or get the wiring all in it. This just makes everything a lot cleaner when you're, when you're working. Plus it looks better, you know. Part of my job is too is I like to make sure things look as good as they can inside and out. So this also helps with that as well. So we got that cleaned up. You can see it didn't take but just a few seconds to do that. And now we don't have to worry about getting that stuff all over our hands and everything else. So I'll just lay these over here. And I'll show you what that looks like. So you can see just how clean that is now. Still a little residue in the corners, but I can at least touch that and I'm not going to get thermal compound all over myself. So there we go. So that's got the power supply out. Everything's removed that's related to power management. So now, let me grab the new supply and we'll start doing the installation here. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is we actually want to set the power supply in where it's going to go. And you want to take a pencil or a marker. I typically use a lead pencil because I can erase it. And we've got to drill new holes uh, to make this, this power supply bolt in because it's got a little different footprint than what you have uh, from the from the transformer and fan assembly. So what I've done is I've already pre-marked my holes with a lead pencil and you can see the little marks there. And that one's pretty close to the original hole. I don't really like that too much but uh, you know that's it's not a big deal. It's not a huge deal. We can we can work with that. If that's the only one then I'm not real concerned about it. So what we'll have to do now is drill that out and uh, then what happens too is the power supply comes with standoffs. So we've got these new standoffs here. These will be going in the holes that we drill. And this is actually what the power supply will mount to over here. Sorry, I'm not watching my camera. <laughs> but these will go in the, the new holes uh, for the power supply. And that's how that'll work. Now you can probably move around. I'm going to play with this a little bit more to see if there's a better placement because I may can move this thing up you know farther but you do have a rivet right there that you have to work with so you really have to move it about where I have it because anything further back you got a ground here you got to work with as well so uh, that's about the best placement I can find just looking at it there 
So that's where we're going to drill. And so we'll drill new holes for our standoffs, get the standoffs mounted in here, and then uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so now I'm about to drill the holes. I got my drill set up here uh, to a 532 bit is what I found uh, works real well with the size of these standoffs. That gives you a little bit of wiggle room, but not very much. Um, so if you have to, if you, if you find that you get a standoff a little off, you can always bore the hole out a little bit more so you can actually slide this over. You just, it's always e easier to start smaller than bigger. That way you can work up to your hole size if you need to. Um, in this case, we're using the 532 starting off because that's actually the size of the standoff uh, diameter that we're going to be using here for the screws. So we'll start by drilling the holes out. And something else I'll tell you too, this is how I'm doing this one. I've got the unit setting off the table. So all this is actually uh, over the table edge. So when I drill through it or whatever, it's not going to actually be drilling through the table. It's another important thing. So we'll start with drilling the holes here. I've already got them pre-marked, as you saw earlier. There's one. And watch your wiring over here. Make sure you don't get into your actual harness wiring. Actually, I need to strap up. Like I said, I got high humidity in here, so my static discharge isn't as high. And this is my unit, so if something happens to it, I'm not real worried about it. There's that one. And at least here at the back. And always watch your hands when you're drilling. Make sure you don't get your hands under it. Just a word of advice. There we go. Just like that. And what, what I'll do too, if I have any spurs on the bottom, what I'll typically do is go with a larger drill bit and just go around the edge with a larger bit just to clean off that edge. And that gets rid of any of the uh, spurs on the bottom side from the drill bit going through a little too fast. So there's that. So now we're ready to actually install the standoffs for the power supply. Now something I'm doing a little bit different than the procedure given is that uh, they actually want you to remove this tray right here. This is this uh, aluminum tray that's riveted in. But actually I'm going to keep that because it kind of keeps an isolation between the outer chassis right here. So that way if something did happen it wouldn't actually hurt the power supply and also it just kind of gives it a nice little tray in my opinion. I just kind of want, want to keep it somewhat original as far as the chassis goes on my particular unit. So what I had to do was actually the screws that came with this uh, these standoffs are a little short so when I actually put them through the chassis they don't stick all the way through so I can't get enough thread on them to really be secure. So I went, I went to uh, Lowe's and bought some M4.78 by 12s and this is what I'll be using. Now you also need to pick up a set of washers, some uh, four millimeter washers as well. So you have something like this. You have a locking washer, um, yeah, a locking washer that comes with the with the hardware that you get. And then I just put a a flat washer with that. And what that does, that gives you enough clearance so you can actually tighten down on this once you get the uh, standoff in there. Otherwise, these are a little too long for the standoff. They actually bottom them out so you can't get them tight. So uh, that's what I'm doing in my case, mainly just because I want to keep this tray, like I say. You can, you can eliminate this tray if you wanted to by removing the rivets. You've got four rivets holding it in. Remove the ground back here. This is the ground that uh, connects the upper chassis to the bottom chassis. Um, and you'd remove that tray. But like I say, this is just something optional that I'm doing because I want to keep this tray in mind. So we'll start here. We'll take one of the standoffs here to the new holes we drilled. And we'll stick it through here. And put this on there and what I'm going to do I'm not going to tighten anything up real tight just yet I'm just doing a test fit so it's always important just to kind of you know do a test fit so leave everything kind of loose uh, just just till you get everything fitted and tested and then you pull the supply back out and then you want to actually tighten up these standoffs because it's going to be really hard to tighten them up once the power supply is in the unit so I'm going to do this real quick get all these in and I'll be right back okay now I've got the standoffs in the chassis and once again I mount them loose so I can still move everything around. And what I'm doing, I'm just checking to make sure they set flush on the chassis with the power supply in there. You want to check your bottom of your standoffs against the chassis. If you see these things leaning or if it's hard to get it to start, 
um, what you want to do is take that uh, take the power supply back out take that standoff out and then bore that hole over just a little bit uh, until you get enough room in there to where this thing sets flush and that way you'll you won't have any stress or anything on the circuit board of the power supply um, so once you get everything tightened here, I'm just going to give you a demonstration here. You'll take your star washer, this is called a star locking washer. You'll put it on the standoff of the supply. And of course you'll take your nut and put that on there and then tighten up. And you got four of these. So the four of these guys, you do this too. As far as the power goes, mine's going to be a little bit different here than the procedure as well because I did keep this tray. So I'm keeping my, my earth ground connection between the upper and lower chassis right where it was as the factory. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm actually going to be tying the ground of the power supply into this this ground right here, which is hard off the actual IC plug. So this is the, the first part of earth ground. That way you know you got a good solid earth ground right there. And I'm going to be taking this and actually installing it onto the wire, crimping it onto this wire. And it'll be going right there along with the chassis connection. That way we got a solid ground. We know we got a solid ground on the supply itself. And that's just what I'm going to do. Now I'm not going to connect my AC power up till later, but I will show you too that the color wires match exactly the color wires on your power supply. So basically you just go uh, blue to blue, brown to brown. So brown being your bottom connector, blue being your upper connector of this power switch. And then that's how you're going to connect power. We still got a lot to do before we get to this point. That's why I'm leaving that unplugged. It's always wise just to connect AC last. Um, that way you don't accidentally have turn on or anything like that. Um, so now we're going to get into a little bit more of the, of the circuitry stuff. Okay, we're first going to start with this connector. So this is the connector that plugged into the power supply that feeds the main unit. There's two wires you have to uh, reverse locations with, and that's the black wire and the black stripe wire right here. If we look at the pin from right to left, it'll be one, two, it'll be the third pin and fourth pin of this connector. So what I do to remove these two pins, I use just a flat blade screwdriver. I've got one like this right here. I'll turn this connector up like this. And basically what you have is you have a little uh, pin that you'll just take, push in on. And sometimes it's, it's a little tricky to do this sometimes. We'll take it, push on that pin, and we should be able to get that wire to unlatch. And we did. Just like that. Oops, sorry, you can't see it, can you? Uh, so we get this wire un unplugged just like that. So there's that one. And then you want to unplug this black wire. So let me watch my camera on this one if I can, so I can show you guys. So basically what I do is I take this, I push in on that little pin, kind of push up on the, on the connector while I'm doing that. You can see it's actually unlatched right there. And we can pull it out. And that's how that works. And then we're just going to reverse locations with the two connectors. So what you want to do first is you want to make sure that this little tab right here, you didn't flatten it out. Because if you flatten it out, it won't lock in. So what I do is I just run my screwdriver under it. Of course, we didn't flatten this one out too bad. But I'm just going to prop on that just a little bit, just to get it back up a little bit. And then when you push that in, it'll be position 3 this time. You'll take it and you actually hear it click in. Same thing to this one. We'll check, make sure we didn't flatten that connector out too much. Take the screwdriver, stick in there. It's a little tricky sometimes. I've got a smaller screwdriver I use too for this. I just take it and prop a little bit just so it's got a nice little edge on it. And then I'll stick it in, you'll hear it click. Just like that, as you heard. And you can see they're locked in, they're all the way down at the bottom where they should be, like the others. And now that's been done. So now we'll move on. Okay, we're now to the uh the circuitry side of things with this power supply and the things you have to do to install this. So I'm going to walk you through this procedure. I'll read it off and I'll show you what we have to do to the actual board. So first of all it says change battery backup circuit on CPU board. So the CPU board is the digital board for those that may get confused by this. Um, it says cut the emitter of Q1 near PCB and bend free pin up. Remove CR5. You just remove that completely. Solder yellow wire from the new PSU to CR6 cathode. I'll show you that as well. And then you also make sure that there's no short circuits or neighboring 
uh, to neighboring traces, which that's when you do this wire right here. You want to make sure you don't have anything touching, of course. Or sometimes if your solder gets a little burnt, it'll get kind of uh, where it makes little hairs. So you have to watch that as well. Uh, if you're using lead solder, that is, which I do. Um, then it says remove U14 from its socket. This is the actual uh, reset circuit you have to change as well. So you have to uh, remove U14 from its socket and then pin, uh, bend up pin 10. So what you want to do there is just bend the pin out of the socket so it's no longer connected. And of course it says that right here. Make sure there's no connection to pin 10. Place jumper between R14 and CPU reset line. I'll show you where that is. Sold a red wire coming from the new PSU board to the CPU reset line. I'll show you that as well. And then just see additional schematics. And I will say this manual is very nice. Um, it's, it's well documented. He's got documentation here of what I showed you earlier of the wire connection changes as well as a layout of the digital board with the um, added components. Also the reset line which I'll be showing you on the bottom of the board. And of course then your power supply uh, wiring etc. And these eggs you got here. This is where I was talking about where I kept my plate in. You can see I removed the plate in this uh, procedure which I kept that plate. So that's why I had to get longer screws. There's a supply, and of course the ground changes that you'll see uh, here. He's also got it documented in the schematics what he did in the procedure to change the power supply. So you can see that we actually cut the emitter right here. So we removed the, the uh, transistor from the circuit right here. We cut, or we actually removed CR5, so we isolated the uh, regulator going right here to all your RAM chips. So it's no longer actually associated with the RAM. The battery is now connected to the yellow wire right here. So it's well documented. It's got some good documentation here. Um, it's a really it's one of the better written procedures I've seen for for products. So now let me go over here and I'll show you what it looks like on the board. So now we're back at the at the uh, digital board, which is where the, all the modifications go on. Um, before we start on the board though, this is where you really want to make sure you have an ESD strap um, because we're going to start handling this board and uh, you don't want to damage any of these components with static. So you can see I've already modified my board, but I'm going to walk you through each section, each step of what we just read in the procedure and show you exactly what you do here. So this should make it pretty clear for you. Um, so first of all, it says uh, to cut the emitter of Q1 and remove it from the circuitry. So if we look right here, look at the board, this is U, uh, I'm sorry, this is P48A, this connector right here. This is the one that had the rainbow color connectors coming from the keyboard. Is this socket right here. U26 is right here. Here's Q1. So looking at Q1, uh, we'll zoom in here and I'll show you. It's gonna be the pin that you're gonna remove is the first pin right here. So when closest to the back of the unit, if you're standing in front of the memory mode, it's going to be that first pin. That's your emitter. So you can see I've got an air gap. I've cut it out of circuit. I've got a good air gap. It's not touching any tracings next to it. So all the tracings are clean. And uh, so that's just something you want to make sure too when you do this kind of work is that you don't have anything touching uh, anything else or anything that could bend over and touch another trace in the case of, you know, handling a board or whatever. So that's what you do to Q1, you clip the emitter. So now it also says to remove CR5. So if we look at the board again, looking at this side right here, the lower left hand side, if we look right here, there'll be three diodes. Right here you can see I've already removed my diode. Um, there's three diodes right here. And so you'll remove this middle one, CR5, you'll clip it out of circuit. So it's no longer in circuit. And so that's what you do there. Then it says take the yellow wire from the power supply and solder it to the cathode of CR6. Well, if you look right here, here's your battery. Here's a, here's a uh, capacitor right here. Here's CR6. The cathode is the one marked with the gray line. The gray stripe is your cathode. The non-marked side is your anode. So you solder to the cathode side the yellow wire coming from the power supply. Now the yellow wire coming from the power supply is actually this connector right here. So it's, it's not your main, it's, it's going to be this little guy right here. And that's where you've soldered the yellow wire. So then if we go on to the to read the procedure, it next says remove U14 and lift, lift pin 10. So what you do is you actually pull U14 right here. 
So this is U14. Pin 10 is the third uh, pin from the bottom. So one, two, three, you pull this chip, you lift that, uh, that pin right there so it's no longer going into the socket, it's just floating. And you can cut that off if you like as well. You can just clip that completely out so it's, it's no longer there. Uh, but you'll pull that out of circuit so this chip is no longer connected uh, to the tracings uh, through the socket. So lift pin 10 so it floats. And then what it says to do is, is connect a jumper between R14, which R14 is up here, to the reset line of your processor. So he's got a picture of this as well. Let me unplug this connector again. So if we flip this board over, and he's got a picture of this in the procedure, like I say, but if we flip the board over here, flip the board over, here's the jumper. So this is the jumper that actually connects R14 to your reset line of your processor. And the way to identify this, this is the way I used his procedure and then looked at the board, as I use this tracing right here on top. So it's this tracing that runs all the way down here is the one you'll actually connect to. So you'll solder into that, and then you'll actually go over here. And I looked at this at this uh, trace right here. I used it as, as a identifier, and I soldered right below it, so right there. And so what that does, that connects R14 uh, to your reset bus. For your processor, and then it says take the red wire from the power uh, from the new power supply. Let's flip this board back over here, and here's your red wire right here. Now it solders. Uh, let me get my pencil again so I can show you this. So I soldered it right here, and this is how his procedure shows it done as well. Um, U14 is right here. So as U14, we just lifted the pin 10 of. If we look right here, you got this tracing right here. It's going to be that middle tracing right here. So here's your crystal oscillator for your main clock. And it's going to be, you can see R11 right there. It's going to be this trace right here in the middle that you're going to solder this red wire to. Now i got to clean the flux up on mine. But what you want to do to make sure that you don't have any shorts between any of these is I use a meter uh, set to ohms. And I just ohm everything out, make sure there's no issues there. Also do a continuity check between this wire and R14. So to do a continuity check, you can actually go to this trace here, and you can go to the top side of R14, the side closest to the back, and you should have zero ohms between there, or very, very low ohms between here and there. So basically a short between R14, the top, and this wire. That's what you want. And then also just ohm out across the tracings next to it, make sure you don't have any solder splash or anything like that that's shorting out the other tracings. And that's pretty much it. That's what you do. Um, that's the that's the digital board side of it. And so then you can reassemble this, put everything back together, and that's going to be that that part of it. Okay, guys, I got everything back together. I've double checked everything about three times just to make sure everything's good. You cannot I cannot stress that enough when you do modifications like this to always double check, you know, multiple times because. Uh, all it takes is one thing wrong, and you apply power, and something could happen. Now you, now you got to spend time troubleshooting, which is now on your clock because you caused the problem. So, uh, you know, it's always good to really investigate, make sure everything looks right. Uh, one thing it did say in the procedure I'm going to call out um, is that it says make sure that this connector right here is is connected. Uh, the little connector going on the new power supply for the reset circuitry. Um, it says that it has a big red box. Um, if this is unplugged during, during power, um, it causes an overcurrent situation, which is not good. So I don't want to find out what it does, so we're not going there. <laughs> so just always make sure you have that plugged in before you do power. Just double check everything really good. I've got my ground connected, as I mentioned I was going to do. I've got it tied in up here with the earth ground off the IEC plug. So we got all that plugged in. You can see now my power cable is all connected to the switch for the supply. And uh, I've just double checked everything. I'm actually going to be taking my readings off the uh, DMUX board as it calls for in the service manual for the memory MOOC. So that doesn't change. Uh, we'll actually take our readings at uh, C74, C75 for the negative 15 volts. And then we'll also go up here to the cap above it. I cannot remember what the value, I mean what the reference designator is. Maybe I can read it right there. Let's see what is that. 
C73, I believe is what it is. So C73 will be our plus 5 volts. So I've start, it says start with the 15 volts in the service manual, or in the manual for the uh, power supply. So we'll start with the 15 volts, then go to negative 15. Now to calibrate these things is you've got trim pots. So this will be your plus 15 here. This is your negative 15. And your 5 volts is actually adjusted on this module. Um, it's going to be located right below here. I don't know if I can get on camera or not, but it's a little trim pot right there, a little white trim pot. You can kind of see it on my camera. So I can zoom in there a little closer, not too much. It's right, basically it's right there. I can't really get on my camera that well, but it's right there. That's where you actually take your, calibra your calibration for your 5 volts. And so the spec calls in the memory mode manual is everything supposed to be like 15.000 uh, negative 15.000 and plus 5.000 um, and I've got a five digit multimeter so I can actually really check against that I got a five digit so I can do uh, precision calibrations on these units um, so anyways here's the moment of truth I have a feeling it probably will not have the presets in it because we've worked all over the, the digital board and typically that, that causes uh, preset issues um, so you have to like I say save your data before you do all this work and then reload it once you're done. Of course, I'm going to reload it anyways because I'm sure it's going to have corruptions in it regardless even if it has anything at all. So I'm going to be watching the multimeter. Uh, let's see what it does here. One, two, three. Oh, it boots up. I see Moog displayed. I see all the LEDs lit up. That's fantastic. That's really good news. 15.001. That's perfect. That's well within the spec. So let's go to our negative 15 volts. So once again, I'm going to go here on the DMUX. We're going to jump over here to C75, the negative side of the camp. 14.999. That's perfect. It doesn't get much better than that. We'll go up here to the uh, plus 5 volts. So I can do this one-handed here. It's a little tricky getting on this cap even when I service these things. It sounds like we got noise too. I just hit bump the key and I heard a preset. This thing's hard to hold. There we go. Got it twisted my hand right. Just kind of have to watch, make sure I don't short anything out. Alright. Let's see what that reads. 5.0017. That's good. So the supply is width and spec. Fantastic. That's really good. Now I heard a key. I bumped the key. Let's see if it actually plays. Mm. That works. Um, let's go to a different preset. Let's go. We'll go to one of my presets here. Open octave here. Yeah, sounds like I still got dad in. I'm shocked at that. Go to another preset. Just double check. And I would recommend reloading the tape data anyways, because it's just it's wise to do that. And these are all custom presets here, except for that one. Yes, here's a preset I just used on my recent track I posted. working fantastic that's really working great uh, let me see if all the presets I'm just gonna go through some presets if I can find any that's that's uh, it's messed up here it's a factory preset so like it's there that one's there that's one of mine Well, it sounds like we still got tape data. I'm going to go in and reload it anyways, though, because I have a feeling there's going to be some that's corrupt. Because um, anytime you work on the on the RAM, around the static RAM chips or anything like that, there's always corruptions. So go in and load your tape data regardless. 
Um, but this one here actually still has the tape data. I'm pretty shocked at that. Usually when I work on them, they lose the tape data. But uh, anyways, that's the installation of the Synthase power supply in the memory Moog. Uh, I know it's a pretty advanced install there. But uh, once again, Martin, I appreciate the opportunity to work with your supply here. I really do appreciate that. And uh, there'll be more to come here very soon, guys. But uh, thanks for watching. Hopefully this helps you guys out with the power supply. And uh, y'all take care.